The first lesson appointed for this fourth Sunday of Easter is recorded in the book of Acts, the fourth chapter. We begin at verse 1, and just context-wise, this is picking up really in the middle of Peter and John have just healed this man who had been born lame, and, you know, silver and gold we have none, but this we give you, you know, rise in the name of Jesus, and everybody's amazed. We heard about that last week. Well, Peter and John are speaking to the people, proclaiming the good news, and uh, the powers that be take great offense. And that's where we pick up today. So with that, as they, Peter and John, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. And on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, you know, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistles recorded in John's first letter, the third chapter we begin at verse 16. John writes, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and yet closes his heart against him, well, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we will know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and we do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God, and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us, by the Spirit whom He has given us. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of John, the 10th chapter. We begin at verse 11. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand. He cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. And for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the gospel of your Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now, there's an old European custom that says that you don't call anybody by their first name until you've shared a pound of table salt with them. Basically, what this means is that you've had a lot of meals together. Right? The idea is, after so many shared dinners in the home, not at some restaurant, not at some diner, you know, these aren't business dinners, but after so many shared meals, 
Well, you're no longer mere acquaintances or business partners. You know, formalities are no longer necessary. After this many meals, you're now part of the family. You know, you know each other intimately, like family. So now you can be on an informal first name basis. Now, this, this custom, it's founded upon you know, bedrock principles of respect and honor and dignity, which is sadly, you know, probably why most people in America, at least for the past many decades, it's probably why they've never heard of such a thing. Because let's face it, we've been on a very informal first name basis with anyone and everyone for a long time. And it shows, doesn't it? As a culture, we're now reaping what we've sown. And, and the seeds of disrespect and dishonor and informality, these seeds that we've sown over the past couple decades are all now bearing an abundance of fruit, aren't they? And yet, here's the thing. I know, if you're paying attention to the lessons you just heard, uh, you can't help but notice the fact that the common unifying thread here is the name of Jesus, isn't it? However, a closer examination reveals that none of these texts are referring to Jesus informally, right, by his first name only. Now, that's what we hear, but that's our informal default setting at work. Guys, it's not here. It's not, you know, this it's just first name Jesus. It's not there. I mean, look at the reading from Acts, for example. We have there the, the religious establishment, you know, very angry and offended that anyone would dare challenge them and challenge the whole, you know, this is what we've always done mentality. The religious establishment arrests and jails Peter and John. <laughs> Imagine, right, having your competition arrested and jailed. Uh, oh, but it gets worse. It does. The next day, they call Peter and John before them, demanding that they give an answer for their, their quote-unquote, wicked, insurrectionist-type behavior. Right? I mean, these guys, they're, they're daring to proclaim the fact that, you know, the enemy of the state, Jesus, had risen from the dead. And even worse, many of the people who heard this good news were now believing and converting. Right? Thousands of people, upward 5,000 people, were leaving the religious establishment and now becoming Christians. Brother, if you're part of the religious establishment, this is very bad for business. So these guys call Peter and John front and center out of their jail cells. You know, by what power are you doing? By, by what name are you doing these things? Basically what they're saying is, who do you think you are? By whose authority are you doing this? Because, well, let's face it, nobody had more authority than these guys. You know, they're the authorities. Nobody had more authority than them. So, you know, somebody who outranks us better have given you permission. And if there is such a person, well, we'd sure like to meet him. But this is when Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, this is when he speaks up. He kind of barks right back at him, right? Look, so if, if we're being examined, if we're being put on trial here because a crippled man's been healed and you want to know how we did it, well, then let everyone know that it was done solely by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You know, the very same guy you crucified. The very same guy that God himself raised from the dead. It's by him, by this one alone, that this once crippled guy is now standing before you well and in perfect health. Now, did you catch all that? Right? Again, Peter doesn't speak about Jesus, you know, like, like they're buddies, you know, like first name basis. He doesn't speak like this to the establishment, not to these guys. In fact, what Peter does is he shows the utmost respect and formality when he's speaking about Jesus. He uses the divine scriptural title, the Christ. I know you don't hear it in English, you know, Jesus Christ. But in the Greek, it's Jesus the Christ, right? The Christ means the anointed one of God. So he's using a very official title. He also uses, you know, his legal name, his legal identifier, Jesus of Nazareth. So it's only then that Peter goes on to say, this Jesus, right? The Christ, the Jesus of Nazareth, this one. Not some other guy by the name of Jesus. This particular Jesus, this Christ from Nazareth, he is the one that was spoke that Scripture spoken of. You know, you know the the stone that the builders rejected, but God used him to become the cornerstone. And there is no there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
And you know, when you, when you remember the fact that God the Father himself is the one who gave Jesus this name, you know, remember he commanded Joseph in a dream, you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins, because that's what the name means. Well, when you remember all this, you know, all this talk then of there's salvation and no one else, there's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved, well, it makes all the more sense now, doesn't it? And you look at the epistle, guess what? St. John's doing much the same thing, referring to Jesus in an official way, right? As God's own son, the Christ, the promised one, the anointed one of God. John doesn't speak informally of Jesus either, like, you know, like there's some kind of VBS buddies. No, John never teaches to his little children in the faith. He never models to his little children in the faith uh, uh, an informality that disrespects or dishonors the majesty and divinity of God in the flesh. He never does that. You know, this is Jesus, my little children. This is the Son of God, the promised Christ of God. More than this, Almighty God himself commands, not merely suggests or implies or encourages, but commands that we believe, that we put our faith in his name. So again, like Peter had said years earlier, there is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven by which man can be saved or must be saved. You know, this is a huge deal, guys. There are eternal ramifications here. That, I, eternity is at stake. So that, that certainly doesn't seem very informal or nonchalant now, does it? And yet, the beautiful irony here, or the, the beautiful paradox in all this, is the fact that your Lord Christ himself, he saves us from our sins, not with regal pomp and circumstance, you know, and formal titles and such, as if, you know, two nations are signing a trade deal or a treaty. It's not like that. Jesus saves us from our sins in just the opposite fashion, right? By, you know, by the utter informality or, you know, the utter shame and humiliation of the cross. The Lord of, think on that, right? The Lord of all lords, the king of all kings. That's, that's pretty formal. Almighty God himself in the flesh. He lowers himself to become lower than the lowest sinner among men. He makes himself to become utterly nothing in the eyes of God and man. Also that we could be elevated to the status of sons and daughters of God himself. You know, so you point here at the cross, this one, this Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Mary, this one is the only one, the one who saved us from sin, death, and the devil by becoming utterly forsaken and forgotten and unknown by his heavenly Father, all so that we could be called by name by our God and Father. You know, the God and Father who knows the hairs on our head, who knows the thoughts in our hearts before we even utter a word? Faithfully humbling himself to the will of his heavenly Father, this one, Almighty God himself in the flesh, the Lord of life himself, this one humbled himself to lay down his own life for our sake, to, to lay down his life in exchange for ours. And then he took it up again, didn't he? Yeah, I, guys, when Jesus says this in the gospel lesson, he can take up his life. I don't think we realize how big a deal this is. You know, we often think of the resurrection in terms of you know, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, as if Jesus was just a passive recipient. But Jesus is making clear here that he's been given the authority by the Father to raise himself from the dead. And only he has the authority to do this. Nobody else can do this. Now, yeah, you look in Scripture, there are a couple of people in history who have been raised from the dead, but they didn't raise themselves, did they? Jesus took up his own life again. Only this one, only he can do this, and he did it for our sake. You know, because he lives, we will live too. Because he rose from the dead, we will too. Guys, I don't know about you, but that is certainly worthy of high praise and honor and respect, don't you think? In terms of authority, the Lord of life gets the last word, doesn't he? I'm reminded just this past week, April 15th, right? Death and taxes. <laughs> Old Benjamin Franklin's statement. Death and taxes. It comes for everybody. That's the only certainty for anybody. And hey, last I checked, the mortality rate for us children of Adam is 100%. No one's immune from death, are they? 
And yet our Lord Christ, again, I want you to note the titles here. I didn't just say Jesus. The Lord Christ, he shows how he's in charge. As I said, the Lord of life is the one getting the last word here. You know, Death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? Now, to be sure, there's so much more we could be talking about. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that to you. Besides, let's face it, we have more than enough to chew on right now, don't we? But before we close, I, I do want you to think about this. Our Lord Christ, Jesus, he doesn't just share mere table salt with us at an informal meal, does he? No, no, absolutely not. It's here at this feast table that he gives to us his very body and blood in this very holy meal. And yeah, this is a formal holy banquet meal. Do not be deceived here, guys. Recognized in faith, there's nothing more formal or, or more awe-inspiring on this side of eternity than what's taking place at this rail. I mean, this is where heaven is meeting earth. This is where the King of kings, the Almighty Lord of life, is coming to us with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven. He is coming to us and inviting us, not as mere guests or spectators, but he's inviting us as his beloved brothers and sisters, beloved children of God, co-heirs with him in his Father's royal and heavenly kingdom. He's inviting us, in spite of our sinfulness, to come to his feast table, to share in his feast of victory over sin, death, and the grave. Guys, this is where he bids us. You know, this is where he commands us. As often as we are doing this, remember what he has said is going on here. And then take and eat, take and drink for the forgiveness of all your sin, for the peace that surpasses all understanding. Folks, if the one who can conquer sin, death, and if the one who did conquer sin, death, and the grave, if he's telling you that this is his body and blood for peace, for forgiveness, well, do you have any reason to doubt? You see, this is what it means to believe in his name. Salvation isn't yours simply because you know the name Jesus. I mean, even the devil knows the name Jesus. The world is filled with people who know the name Jesus, right? Muslims, Mormons, Jews, they all know the name Jesus, including plenty of people who actually claim to believe in Jesus. They may even have a nice t-shirt or a bumper sticker with the name on it. But the fruits they bear in their daily lives tell a very different story, right? They believe in a Jesus. It's just the Jesus of their own making. It's not the one true Jesus of Holy Scripture. And when you get down to it, all they've really done is taken all their false gods, taken their sins, and given them the name Jesus. You can hear it, right? My Jesus is okay with fill in the blank. My Jesus doesn't consider what I do as sin. My Jesus would never. Well, you're right. I mean, your Jesus wouldn't. But this one, the one true Christ of God, the, the true Son of God, this is the Jesus of Holy Scripture, right? Salvation, forgiveness, true peace with God. All of this is found only in this Jesus, not your Jesus. You're known by your fruits, and the fruits don't lie. Sad to say, guys, simply name-dropping at the pearly gates, that doesn't get you in. Because the one true Jesus is going to say, go away. I don't know you. So I would say, believing in the name of Jesus, it's different. This kind of saving faith, this saving belief, this is a gift of the Holy Spirit, who alone enables a person to trust in all that is wrapped up in this one, the one who alone saves people from their sins. To believe in his name is to hold fast in the humility of repentant faith to him, to his all-redeeming, all-atoning life, death, and resurrection. Right? You're not putting your faith in, in works. or It's not Jesus plus that. No, you're holding fast to him, to his death, death and resurrection. To believe in his name is to hold fast in the childlike humility of faith to his word and promises. It's not a cafeteria-style faith, you know, that, that picks and chooses and believes what it likes, but disregards the stuff that it doesn't like. No, it doesn't work that way. To believe in the name of Jesus is to hold fast in repentant faith, humble faith, 
to all that this name represents, all that is contained in, with, and under this name. Right? Paul talks about in Colossians, in him all the fullness of Almighty God dwells bodily. This one, right? This Jesus, this Christ of God, this Son of God and Son of Mary, this one who conquered sin, death, and the grave by dying and rising to life again, this one who declared triumphantly from his cross, it is finished. Guys, this is the same one who puts his own name upon your head and upon your heart in baptism. This is the same one who knows every hair on your head, who calls you by name, who promises to be with you always, even to the end of the age. And so he is, right? Guys, if this one says it, then what reason do you have to doubt or despair? Believe in the name of Jesus and be at peace. May Almighty God grant this to us all for the sake of Jesus. Amen.